We're going to go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. It says this, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Why is Paul writing this? Because somebody was deceived. And so he's admonishing them, look, don't, don't, don't be tricked by your enemy. Don't, don't be led astray by your enemy. God is not mocked. He, it's, it's not going to be possible for hell to, to make a mockery out of God. It's not going to happen. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. I want to read verse 9 together. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In due season you will harvest if you do not quit. And I preach for the next few moments today, truly believing it's going to be just a few moments, the promise of a seed. Would you set your Bibles to the side right now? Would you lift your hands in the air and ask God to move in this place? God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your presence, which we've already felt in this house today, God. We are focusing our hearts and our minds on you, God. We're looking to you right now. We're desiring, Lord, that you would move in this place. I thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. I thank you, God, for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Come on, would you lift up a sound of triumph in this place? Would you lift up a sound of faith in this house? Would you just begin to allow to bubble out of you an assurance that your God is not mocked? He's not defeated. He's not beaten. He's not in a struggle. He is undefeated. He is undefeated. Unstoppable. Uh, ah, hallelujah. 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 The promise of a seed. You may be seated. Twelve years ago, maybe even 13, a friend of mine who's a farmer in North Dakota, let's just say that 13 years ago, I used to be a lot more into politics than I am right now. I've adopted a new, uh, a new philosophy of life. I listened to talk radio constantly. I read the news nonstop, and I prayed almost nil. My life was out of balance. It was out of order. And so I had a lot of fear in my life. Uh, by the way, if you did not know that, the purpose of the news is to keep you afraid. It's not to solve your fear, it's to keep you in fear. Uh, because if you're fearful, you'll, weirdly enough, go back to this self-completing loop and just consume more news, desperately hoping for some good news. Uh, you're not going to find it on Fox News. You're not going to find it on CNN. You're, you're not going to find it in a political candidate. You, you might find fear. You're not going to find hope. You're not going to find faith. And so I, I, I've changed and I, I live by a new political philosophy. And that is that prayer trumps politics. The word choiceage was intentional. It absolutely trumps politics. The most powerful thing that the church can do is not get out the vote. The most powerful thing that the church could do at this junction of our life and our country is to put our feet on the floor in the morning and open our mouths and begin to declare that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Prayer trumps the politician every single time. It does not matter who is going to be elected. 
Jesus is going to have a church. Jesus is going to have a church, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Now, whomever is elected, it is the duty of the church to pray passionately for them. How many of you are praying passionately for your current elected leadership? Remember, prayer trumps politics. We don't just pray for the leaders we like. We pray for the ones that are clearly struggling. And we pray for the direction. Oh, man, this is not even in my notes at all, but we're, we're, we're plowing ahead. Listen, would to God that a church in Watertown would get a revelation of how power. We talk about it all the time. Well, bless God, we're going to cast out devils. Don't you think if you could cast out devils, you could put your knees in the carpet and influence the direction of an entire city, county, country? You look at the life of Lot. In Sodom, a judge of the community, and he has precisely zero influence in the city of Sodom because the moment he tries to stand up, uh, the entire city turns on him and says, who made you a judge over us? Can I tell you that apostolic influence is not how connected you can get in the community and how many elbows you can rub and how many people you can know. But true apostolic influence and authority will come like the little old man out on the dusty dunes. God comes to Abraham's tent one day and says, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm about to do? You see, prayer trumps politics. And man, I wasn't praying and I was eating up with politics. Had to remember where I was. <laughs> and there was a lot of fear in my life. And so I asked a friend. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to become a prepper. Any preppers in the house? Not preps. I was a prep in middle school. I got accused of that a lot. And so I, I, I tried to shed that reputation. I was like, I'm tough. I'm bad. I'm stupid. <laughs> Try to act stupid so nobody calls you a prep. But I wanted, to, I wanted to prepare for the apocalypse, which Barack Obama was surely bringing down on our heads. And so I asked my friend, I said, hey, can you get me, what, do you, what are you growing this year? He said, same thing I grow every year, corn and beans. They're in a rotation. And so I asked him for some beans. And he gave me several bushels of beans, or I, I guess I don't really know. It was, it was a lot of beans. It was more beans than I've ever seen at one time in one place. And I gathered buckets. I went to the store and I bought buckets. Not food grade buckets, just buckets. And I sealed up 15 gallons of dry beans. That's a lot of beans. Somebody say it's a lot of beans. And for the last 13 years, I've had these beans in my garage. Perhaps you've seen them. There's a stack of orange buckets. They're filled with beans. Listen, if the apocalypse does come, you all come to my house. We'll eat a lot of beans together, okay? <laughs> Bring everything you got, and we'll survive on beans. But for 13 years, these beans have sat in my garage. It's been... As hot as 100 degrees in my garage, it's been as cold as zero in my garage. And the beans have been there. I cracked into them one time for a chili cook-off. We, uh, we got the beans out and we got them soaked up. We got third place that year. It was amazing. Third place at the chili cook-off, Coddington County at Bramble Park Zoo, representing Jesus Church. The trophy's down in the case downstairs if you want to see it. That was the OG club. I think that was probably 2013. Uh, there were like four of us there. And I think, Troy, Troy, you remember the bean day? We were cooking in the park. The monkeys were screaming. And we're cooking chili at the park. It was an amazing time. But other than that one time, I've never touched those beans. They've sat in a bucket. Those beans had potential. But they were untouched. Those beans contained within them a promise, but they were untouched. They were banished to a bucket in the corner of a garage, surrounded by other beans. 
They're in a five-gallon bucket with beans. You can feel real comfortable as a bean with five gallons of other beans. But the purpose of the bean was never being fulfilled. That purpose that it was created for, the very reason that a plant would reach up towards the sun and at the same time reach down into the earth and pull water and nutrients out of the earth and then begin to put out flowers and then pods and produce seeds only to be collected and stored in a bucket in a garage. Until about two weeks ago, when the Lord gave me a word about the promise of a seed. So I went to a bucket in my garage, and we pulled out a bean. And we took the beans inside, a couple of them, and we put them in a Ziploc bag on a damp paper towel in the window. And for about the first week, nothing happened. Until one day, one of the beans split open. And now what you see in front of you is the promise of a seed. It's got leaves beginning to emerge. You can't see them, but we just repotted it this morning. It's got long roots. It's putting down roots. That seed sat in a bucket for 13 years. Until finally somebody grabbed a hold of the seed and moved it to an environment with the ingredients for growth. Faith is as simple as a seed. And every seed contains within it a promise. Now, unless somebody adopts this seed and takes it home and puts it in a bigger pot, well, I'm kind of done with it. <laughs> But if anybody wants it, you can have it after service, okay? I've, 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 we've, we've proved the point. I'm going to put it right here, though. If you'll allow me to be incredibly simple today, I just have two points to make. The first point is this. It's very easy for us to come here as a seed and be surrounded by other seeds and, and keep all of that promise inside of a bucket. But you were never intended to be here just with other seeds all the time. This is not, this is just a small piece of what God's called you to do. This is not Christianity. Out there is Christianity. In here we come together to just be ourselves and worship the Lord and celebrate everything he's done all week long. But if you just remain in the bucket, nothing happens. And all it took... For a 13-year-old seed to begin to produce the promise was to be moved into the right environment and the right ingredients for growth. All it took was a damp paper towel and a little bit of sunlight. And I've come today in the Holy Ghost just to challenge somebody. Some of us are sitting on promises from God that we've been holding on to for 12 years or for 13 years or for 15 years or 20 years. But I've come to provoke somebody in the Holy Ghost and to let you know there is life within that seed. There's a promise from God that's been given to you. And all it's going to take from you is to get it out of the bucket again and to to bring it into a place where the atmosphere is going to be right uh, and you're going to take that seed uh, and you're going to bury it in the ground and you're going to cover it with dirt uh, and you're going to begin to water it with the tears uh, of your prayer uh, and you're going to begin to water it with the truth of the word of God uh, and you're going to begin to speak those things that God put inside of you uh, and you're going to begin to exercise the faith uh, that God gave you for that seed uh, and the promise of the seed uh, is that one day uh, it's going to come up out of the ground. Uh, one day little leaves are going to poke up. Uh, one day roots are going to go down. Uh, one day branches are going to spread out uh, and there will be a production uh, of the promise of God uh, all because uh, of one little seed. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? Uh -huh. 
James, Kenow, not the book. I asked him before I talked about him. He said I could. James was one of the first people that Bishop met in Watertown. Certainly in the first couple dozen. At the Boys and Girls Club. Eight years old? Eight years old. Recently lost a father. And Bishop's just working at the Boys and Girls Club, trying to be a light, trying to be an influence. You know, Ecclesiastes tells us that if you observe the clouds and you observe the wind, you're not going to sow. But if you'll just sow like God has intended you to sow, that seed carries within it a promise. And at the age of eight or nine or whatever it was, there was a little bit of love that was deposited in the heart of a young man. And then that seed went in a bucket in a garage. And it lied dormant for a while. Again, at the age of 18, a young man, still named James, same guy, he's, he's, he's facing a little bit of trouble. Living the results of a broken home and a broken life. All of a sudden, something incredible happens. In an environment he did not want to be in, somebody came in and began to sprinkle a little water on the seed that was planted a decade ago. Corinthians reads this in the New Living Translation. It says, I planted the seed in your heart, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it to grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes it to grow. Can I tell somebody today, stop worrying about how in the world you're going to get somebody from point A to point B where they're a complete disciple of Jesus Christ. And would you simply do the job uh, of being a sower of the word uh, and just put the word in their heart. Uh, it may not look like they're hearing. Uh, it may not look like they're responding. Uh, but you sow the seed because uh, the seed carries a promise. Uh, and it may not look like uh, your prayers are doing anything. Uh, but you water the seed uh, because the seed has uh, a promise within it. And it doesn't matter who sows it. It doesn't matter who waters it. Uh, but somebody's got to sow it. Uh, and somebody's got to water it. Uh, or else the promise of the seed uh, will forever lie dormant in a bucket in a garage. Filled with potential. But nothing being realized. And so in 2015... James came to the house of God for the very first time. I should have got the picture. I'm sorry. And he was baptized in Jesus' name. I'm so thankful for the life-giving power in the name of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, what the law could not do, and I mean quite literally the law of South Dakota, could not do uh, the blood of Jesus Christ accomplished in just a moment. Uh, it was able to wipe out every transgression, every wrong, uh, and everything that he'd ever done that was contrary to God. But the seed wasn't totally complete. It still needed a little bit more watering. You see, when it starts to come up out of the ground, it's not time to quit. When, when they come to church for the first time, it's not time to stop praying. When you see that little glimpse for the first time, it's not time to stop and to back off. Uh, it's time to keep watering. Uh, it's time to start pulling some weeds. Uh, it's time to start removing some stones. It's time to keep investing in prayer uh, in that person. And it, it would be a few years. It would be a few years. There would be some ups and there would be some downs. And I, I will never, I will never forget. I'm going to see who remembers this. In 2020 in May, uh, brother, I believe it was May, brother Tim Green was here. Anybody remember Tim Green coming in May of 2020? 
And we were in the chapel having a, having a, a service uh, with, the, with the leaders of the church. And he's, he's operating in the gifts of the Spirit so powerfully as he does. And he stops. And he goes, is James here? Where's James? And at the time, James was not there. James was running from God. But in that moment, in that moment, God planted another seed of faith. And Tim Green looked at the, I mean, we're weeping at this point. We're like, he's not here. (laughs) He's in a bucket in the garage. (laughs) And God planted a seed of faith and said, he's going to be back in just a couple of weeks. And wouldn't you know it, a couple of weeks later, life a mess and, a, and, and, and falling apart. James gets a hold of Bishop, uh, and I'm so thankful to say uh, it's not been a looking back since then. Why? Uh, because somebody planted the seed in an 8-year-old life. Uh, somebody watered the seed in an 18-year-old life. Uh, a church kept praying for him. A church kept watering the seed. Uh, a church kept investing uh, until the day uh, when roots were down uh, and branches were strong uh, and flowers began to produce uh, and fruit uh, began to grow off the life. Why? Because there's promise in every single seed that would ever be placed in the ground. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. It doesn't matter who's the one. It doesn't matter who teaches them a Bible study. I don't care if four people teach them a Bible study. It doesn't matter who baptizes them in Jesus' name for crying out loud. Let's just get the seed in the ground and then put some water on the seed so it can begin to grow. There's a promise in this seed. It's starting to be fulfilled. If somebody was diligent with it, in a couple of seasons, we could fill this room with plants from this seed. If they remained diligent with it, it wouldn't be but a year or two. We could feed everybody in this room with plants from this seed. Do you understand the power in one seed? You don't know what's going to happen when you walk into work and you begin to declare to somebody what God did in the house of God on Sunday. What are you doing? You're planting seed. You walk into your workplace and they ask you how you're doing. You you can be honest with them. Don't lie to them. If you're having a bad day, tell them you're having a bad day. But there better be some faith that comes out of your mouth. And you better begin to testify of God's faithfulness and God's goodness. Uh, oh, uh, oh! Uh, maybe everything in your life's not going well, but what are you doing? You're planting seed. You're planting seed. I want to speak right now to somebody. God gave you a word. God gave you a word a long time ago, and it doesn't seem to be coming true. You don't dig up what God planted in your life to check if it's growing. Too many times we get... We get bent out of shape. We get frustrated. We get discouraged. We get worried. Is is it really coming to pass? Did God really say that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You get home on a Monday after a great Sunday, and you're like, did God really say that to me? And so we dig up the seed to investigate it again and say, "Did, did, did God say that? And doubt begins to fill our heart, and it begins to fill our minds. But if you'll allow it to be buried under the soil, and you'll allow it to do what Jesus declared, uh, he said, except a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, uh, hear me, somebody, right now, if you'll allow uh, yourself to be planted under the soil, uh, if you'll allow God to hide you in a place uh, where nobody can see you, if you'll allow God to take your ministry, I'm talking talking to somebody right now. Uh, You'll allow him to take that loved one that you've been praying for uh, and you'll allow him to plant it deep underneath the soil uh, where nobody can see it uh, and nothing looks like it's happening uh, and your future looks bleak and it's just dirt. 
If you'll allow it to be there, uh, there's a promise within that seed. Uh, your only job is to hold it in that dirt. Uh, your only job is to put some water on it every so often uh, and keep it in a place uh, where the light of God can shine on it uh, and the sun can hit it. Uh, don't throw it away. Uh, don't cast it away. Uh, whatever has been sown in your life, uh, it is going to be harvested. It is going to be harvested. In Psalm chapter 126, in verse 6, it says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. What did he go out carrying? What did he go out carrying? Seed. What did he come in carrying? Harvest. The sheaves. See, it's a simple point today, but if you'll allow me today, I, I want to just drive a simple point home. There's a promise in every single seed that's ever been deposited in your life. Uh, and there is a promise in every seed you're planting uh, in your coworker and in your neighbor. Uh, but it's not time to back off of the promise. It's not time to quit on the promise. Uh, it's not time to give up on that lost loved one. Uh, it's not time to give up on that son or that daughter. Uh, it's not time to give up on your parents. Uh, it's not time to back away from what God's promised. Uh, it's not time for Jesus Church to stop believing uh, in a breakout revival. Uh, it's not time. Uh, no, uh, no, we're going to believe that there's going to be a radical apostolic church uh, in all 66 counties. Uh, we're going to believe that there are going to be churches of 500 uh, and 1,000 that spring up across South Dakota. What are we going to do? Uh, we're going to speak that seed. Uh, we're going to plant it by faith, uh, and we're going to water it. We're going to go out bearing precious seed with us, uh, and we're going to put it in the ground. Uh, and there's going to be some tears along the way. Uh, God has ordained it to be so. Uh, he that goeth forth and weepeth. Seed could feed you. That bucket of beans could feed me. But now I've delayed that to put it in dirt and watch it grow. But you realize that if you'll allow it to go and to die and be separated from you, the promise is that it will be a far greater return than whatever it was. Hear me, you feel like you need to go to work and save your breath. You feel like you need to go to a family reunion and save your breath. But if you'll just invest it and you'll plant it in the dirt, God will bring forth something that's far greater than anything you could ever imagine. You might be looking at your ministry in your 20s and 30s. You might might be asking God about direction for your life. Uh, you might be thinking, where do I go from here? Uh, I'm in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, and nobody knows my name. Uh, so what? Uh, invest it into the soil of the ground. Uh, plant it in the ground uh, and watch what God will do with one solitary seed. Uh, would you stand to your feet in this house today? Uh, and would you lift your hands in the air? Uh, But you will never harvest what you never plant. Is that too simple today? You're not going to harvest what has not been planted in the ground. Don't be deceived. God is, God is not mocked. If we think that's going to come without effort on our part, we're deceived. And we ourselves are mocking God. But if we'll remember whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. I want to share, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to follow the Holy Ghost right here. I want to share with you 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. 
And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I believe that there is a stirring of faith in this house today. There's a stirring of faith in this house today. And I believe that God has, has, has challenged us and is about to challenge us to begin to speak out better things. To begin to declare out better things. You, you, you've heard this before, but hear it again. He's a God which calls those things which be not as though they were. Romans chapter 4. He's a God that spoke out into nothingness the seed of His voice. And it came to be. In fact, Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 16 says this. I have put my words in your mouth. And I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand. Uh, hear that, Jesus Church. I believe that is God's word uh, for you. Uh, I believe it's God's word for Next Town Ministry. Uh, his words are in your mouth. And he has covered you in the shadow of his hands. Uh, that I may plant the heavens uh, and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, uh, thou art my people. Do you understand that God wanted to take you as the seed with promise and plant you into South Dakota and bury you where you could not be seen and water you every so often so that your life would begin to grow and to produce fruit? He's a God that planted the heavens. He's the God that hung celestial gardens. He's the God that made every beautiful thing that you see all oh, by the power of his voice. And you were created in his image. And when God begins to lay on your heart faith for specific things, it is not for you to hide it and to bury it, but it is for you to begin to take it out and with your words begin to plant it, uh, begin to plant it in the heavens, begin to plant it uh, around Watertown, begin to declare it. Uh, that's the power of speaking it with your mouth. Uh, I'm not saying that you're going to say right now, well, I want a Lamborghini with spinning rims uh, and there'll be one out in the parking lot. Uh, that's you consuming it upon your own lust. You're asking amiss. Uh, but when God begins to lay something on your heart after his own desires, uh, he's not expecting you to put it in a bucket in your garage and keep it there. He's expecting you to take it out and to plant it by speaking it and living it and acting as if it's already so. Brendan, you could not have set it up more perfectly today because the point that God wants to bring us to is a place where we begin to act as if it is already done. Why? Because there's a promise in every single seed. The farmer expects the crop to come up. When you put a seed in the ground, you expect it to come up. When you plant faith... You expect a harvest of faith. But when you plant doubt, you expect a harvest of doubt. And so right now in this place, I'm just going to open this altar to anybody that feels a stirring of faith inside of them. We're, we're, we're just going to step into an atmosphere where we begin to declare some things and we begin to speak some things. If, if there's, hold on one second, if there's a prayer request that God's been laying on your heart, for a couple of weeks, a couple of days, a couple of months, even a couple of years. Today, you're going to come and you're going to pray. And you're going to pray as if you have all of the authority under heaven and earth. Because you do. And you're just going to begin to declare it to be so by faith. Though you don't see it with your eyes. If you've got a lost family member in this house. Anybody got a family member you've been praying for for a while? Here's what we're going to do. 
we're just going to plant some seed and we're going to water some seed and we're going to call upon the promise that God put inside of that seed and we're going to ask it to begin to grow right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, anybody need a financial miracle? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to recall every single promise and every verse that we can about finances. We're going to remember every time that God's done something for us before. And we're just going to speak faith into the atmosphere. And we're going to put the seed of faith out there. And we're going to put a little water on it and a few tears on it. And tomorrow I'm not going to dig it back up with the shovel of doubt. But I'm again going to put some tears on it and begin to declare what God has promised me. Anybody got a vision God's given you for a ministry or a church that you're leading? I got a couple. Well, then what we're going to do is we're going to declare that vision again. Uh, and we're going to hold fast to the one that planted the heavens in the sky uh, and laid the foundation on the earth uh, and declared over you and over your church that you are my people. Uh, that's what we're going to be. Uh, we're going to be a people of faith uh, and not a people of fear. Uh, we're not going to speak doubt. We're going to speak faith. Uh, and so if you're ready in this place right now uh, to begin to speak faith, I want you to come to this altar. Uh, I want you to get as close as you can to this front. Uh. Ah.